he's going to be talking about implementing an open EO compliant backend for processing data cubes on JEODPP. So please join me in welcoming Peter. I use the phone. Uh, the oh, mic. Yes. yes, please. Uh, thank you for this introduction. So my name is Peter Kempeneers. I'm with the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission, uh, located in Ispra. And I'm going to talk about its implementation of an open EO compliant backend for processing da data cubes on our uh, data uh, and processing platform. I would like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, uh, Thomas Clement, André, who is also in this room, uh, Davide De Marchi and uh, Pierre Swal. This is the outline of my talk. Um, so I'm going to introduce this, this backend, uh, this, this, this data in uh, processing platform. I also introduce you to the concept of OpenEO. Uh, there was a, a, a talk of, um, uh, of Jeroen Dries on Wednesday, uh, but in case you missed it, I uh, will go over the, uh, the concept here again and then talk about how we try to incorporate this open EO or to make our uh, backend compliant uh, to the concept. Um, then I will show you some uh, results um, on the building blocks we have been built on uh, for this uh, open EO uh, and, and for our internal use as well. So uh, there's a, a data catalog to, to query our Im image collections and then we're getting cl quite close to uh, the presentation before, so also it was on, on data cubes, so this is a bit a similar approach. And then uh, we've also been working quite hard on uh, an open source Python uh, package called PyGeo, which um, uh, is also used for this uh, results I, I show you at the end, and hopefully uh, some, uh, if there's some time, some, some two small uh, videos uh, live. Uh, so what is this uh, GeoDPP? It's, uh, it's a uh, processing platform with about 12 uh, petabytes of, uh, of data. Most of it, it's um, Copernicus Sentinel-2 data. Uh, the data are connected to the processing nodes um, uh, with 10 gigabit uh, switches. For the processing itself, we have about 1500 cores. Uh, and then um, I will go through uh, especially two of the three I've listed here uh, components of this data pr uh, and processing platform, uh, which we call GeoDesk, GeoBatch, and uh, GeoLab. And it's especially uh, those last two I will um, uh, cover in, in, in a bit more detail. Here, a, a bit of a schematic overview of what the GeoDPP uh, is, uh, is about. Um, as an entry point uh, for the internet, we have the, the web services. Uh, we have an internal uh, part of the web services, which uh, you see here as a JRC uh, web services. Then there's the OpenEO part, which is supposed to be uh, the entry point uh, uh, f for users in general, um, but like this is a proof of concept, so it's not yet for the, 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 the public, let's say, for now. Um, and uh, there's a catalog, the data catalog uh, who is querying uh, the data we have uh, stored uh, on, our, on our platform. Then uh, one layer below, um, we have the OpenEO backend that uh, makes things happen for OpenEO. It, uh, and uh, the services uh, below the web services for internal use, the GeoDesk uh, batch and lab. And all of this being served by this uh, PyGeo uh, uh, library in, uh, in Python we've, we've uh, uh, designed. Uh, so um, very briefly, these web services, the internal web services, what are they? There's a GeoDesk, which is uh, nothing else than uh, a clientless desktop gateway. So you have uh, the impression as working in your own uh, desktop, but at the end, it is uh, just a web uh, uh, service. And uh, the advantage of it is that all the software is already pre-installed, and there is a, a very fast connection to uh, the data, so it's located near the data. Uh, it's very, it's much faster than if you would have your own desktop and trying to access data over the network. Um, then there's uh, GeoBatch, which allows uh, users to uh, pr uh, pr process uh, data at large. Uh, and there's uh, GeoLab, um, which is um, a similar thing as the 
the Google Earth engine. So it's um, it's a visualization and analysis uh, platform that works in uh, processing with in a deferred mode. So it's only processing what you see uh, at the resolution you see in in your viewer. So let's go a bit into more detail in in how to make this. Uh, uh, compliant uh, to OpenEO, what's, what's the idea behind? So this is a general concept. Um, what you see here on, on, on the right is um, clients can uh, access the OpenEO in their own um, programming language, be it R, Python or JavaScript, and uh, they can push their code onto any of the compliant backends, uh, so making it interoperable. Uh, what's happened, uh, make this happen is the standardized communication interface in between that translate the client end's uh, programming uh, software to, thank you, uh, how does it work? Yeah, the client uh, languages are Python and JavaScript in a kind of an intermediate language in, in the form of a graph, which is, um, then uh, transformed into a JSON, uh, JSON file. And the, the different backends are then responsible of translating this uh, standardized graph, uh, what we call the core API of OpenEO, into their own uh, uh, implementation. This is how it looks like uh, in more uh, practical terms. We start with a collection. Um, this is like uh, more of an abstract idea, uh, as we saw before in the, in the, in the, in the data cubes. Uh, rather than having file based, um, a, a file based approach, we're not talking about files anymore, but a user think uh, about a collection can be Sentinel 2, uh, level 2A, for example, uh, as a collection. Uh, it then filtered this collection by a bounding box, a uh, geographical bounding box, or and a date range. Uh, this data is then loaded into uh, on-the-fly data cubes, where the user specifies a spatial resolution, a temporal resolution, uh, projection, uh, perhaps uh, a resampling if it's not the, the default um, nearest neighbor, and we create a data uh, cube on the fly. This is the internal data model, so we're working with three-dimensional data cubes uh, where the third dimension is uh, used for the time, uh, XY for the spatial dimension, and the spectral bands are uh, internally then uh, different data pointers. So it's, in fact, uh, a multi-band uh, three-dimensional data cube. This data cube is then further processed um, by interpreting this graph um, sent by OpenEO. Uh, to the server, and this graph is then parsed and then translated into the backend's own uh, implementation details. This is an internal kitchen for the uh, the backend, and uh, until a point where the last node uh, says, uh, "I want to save this data," and this data is then uh, feed fed back to uh, to the user or um, visualized on some screen. To make this happen, uh, we've created this PyJO uh, library in Python uh, that serves uh, not only the OpenEO but also the other internal uh, services uh, for our internal users at the, the, uh, the Joint Research Center. And I'll uh, go a bit into more detail about this, uh, this library. Uh, it's a Python package for anal analysis of geospatial data. It's uh, developed in-house, and we are in the process of making this open source uh, with the EU uh, public license. It is um, able to bridge to other libraries, uh, such as uh, NumPy, uh, without duplicating the, the memory. Uh, it is, at the core, written in C, C++ for performance, and we have bound this automatically through SWIG uh, for flexibility uh, that it's uh, better to, to prototype and easier to prototype. Uh, and then it can be used both in batch mode and in interactive modes, as we will see uh, later in the examples. Uh, just a few words on how this is done. So here, what, what you see on the left, uh, it is the, the core uh, libraries written in C and C++. 
there is this uh, interface file uh, you have to manually read, uh, write and uh, this is then used by SWIG to create uh, the, a SWIG module which is linking, uh, compiling and linking all these uh, things together in order to get a, a Python uh, package. The, so the magic is all done by, by SWIG. Uh, what you define actually here in this interface file is a list of the uh, the functions you want to bind and there's also a whole world of pain you can go into um, if you uh, define uh, type maps and if you want to change some of the things you um, you want to uh, uh, customize uh, but other than that it works quite well out of the box and uh, still it's it's magic for me how it works but at the end you get into a, a python a package uh, from your uh, C++ library. Then, uh, because this is an automatic uh, system, the Python package you end up with is um, not so easy to work with. So what we've done here, and this is where uh, Andre is coming into uh, the scene, he's done a great job in uh, putting this all into uh, Python modules. So for the user, there's only what you see on the right-hand side in, 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 in yellow. Uh, you see these Python modules, which are then accessing the, the JIPLIP module here, this, the, the SWIG module, which is then accessing the, the dynamic uh, libraries uh, where the C++ codes uh, have uh, come into. So let's uh, see what, how this can be used. Um, the example I'll give here is um, something we've been working on um, for quite some time. It's creating a global uh, Sentinel-2 cloud-free composite uh, based on level 2 ADO, so atmospherically corrected data. Um, produced at full spatial and spectral resolution, so at each of the spectral resolutions we, um, we have, we, we are using the native um, spatial resolution at 10, either 20 or 6, 60 meters. Um, we, at the time we had been building this, it was, uh, we have used data from 2017. Uh, there was not yet the uh, atmospherically correct data delivered by ESA, so we had to do this on our platform with the Centucore uh, software. And uh, for those of you who are interested, we have published uh, the result, all this data you can download. Uh, for now, it's still all uh, in tiles, in, uh, but um, we're also planning to do uh, some, uh, in some uh, web map service that you can visualize the data more easily. Internally, however, uh, so just, just um, some, some details here on the large-scale processing. Uh, what the, the way we've done it, we have kept the original resolutions in, uh, of the MGRS tiles. Uh, there are about 30,000 tiles that are covering the landmass uh, of the world, and it took about 15 hours to, uh, to process all these, all these tiles. Um, internally, what we use to visualize this data, so all these data are still in, uh, in tiled format. Um, we have created overviews for all the tiles that are in the same projection, creating a, a virtual uh, a VRT file from, for it and uh, create some overviews for each of those VRT files. And then by creating a collection, so uh, making the loop, uh, as you were mentioning it in, in your presentation, we can create back uh, a, a collection so we can either use it for visualization but also for the processing. And this is how it's done. So if it works, I would like to show you a small video on um, on how we visualize this then in our platform. So this is uh, should be uh, this one here. It's not working or somewhere hidden. Uh, there's, uh, maybe you have to click on one of those. It's over off the side of the room. Somewhere on the end there. <laughs> the, the room next door, maybe.
Okay. So here, uh, this, this is in a Jupyter notebook. So um, we create a collection on the, in, in the cell upper left, and then uh, the tiles are being accessed and we can zoom and browse, uh, as we, we all know it also from the, the Google Earth Engine. Uh, this is the actual product that's been created. Um, uh, you see the visual bands here at uh, 10 meters, uh, spatial resolution. So I zoom here in, um, in the area of Bucharest. But the, the nice thing is that so it, you don't have to prepare anything of the data rather than, than creating these virtual files and with their overviews, you can just browse uh, and, and, and it's loaded. Um, at uh, at any time you um, you zoom into uh, it, the the right uh, uh, tiles are being are being selected. So okay, um, so other than just visualizing, uh, what we also can do is interactively uh, process the data. How uh, control L was it right? We can also interactively process the data with with this uh, PyGeo library. Um, then this is done in uh, GeoLab. At the upper left, we see we we create a collection uh, where we zoom into an area, uh, selecting S Sentinel two data. Here we create um, the code, importing the uh, the PyGeo library, and we can create a code. That is then what we can normally use for, for the large-scale processing, but here it is used in the deferred processing mode. So everything what is being, uh, if we create a map here, uh, if we zoom into an area, if we, if we pan the map, the area that is processed, uh, this, uh, this, um, process, this code is actually processed in execution mode in deferred processing. So, um, and this allows you to um, to actually prototype as if you would process an entire uh, data set of the entire world, which is of course much faster, uh, otherwise you have to do the entire processing of the entire globe and in, in, at the end to see that your algorithm is not working in this part of the world or in that par part of the world. And it's so much easier to, um, to do it in the interactive mode where you can just browse to an area and then it's only processed on that resolution in that area. Um, I'll, I'll just end with a conclusion and then maybe we can show the other video. Uh, so uh, I've been into some uh, details of the GeoDPP backend um, showing what uh, the PyGeo Python package is all about. Uh, we have, it, we, it can serve both the batch and the interactive processing mode. Um, we have seen that uh, the, the components that make it OpenEO uh, compliant, uh, with for example the collection catalog that is uh, written in, in, uh, as a RESTful uh, API, we can create on the fly data cubes uh, from collections and then processing the, uh, these data cubes. What still, uh, there's still some work in process, we're not there yet. Um, we still have to work on the job queues, on the, on the graph parsing, and uh, also the user authentication. And so by uh, just finishing off here, I would like to see if this other uh, video is also working. I'm not sure. So this is the, uh, this one. Okay, I'll let, leave this up to you. Okay, so here you see um, I'm creating a collection here on the upper left. This is the actual code that's going to be uh, processed. So if we cut this code, it can also be used to, uh, to run uh, on, on the full uh, uh, tiles in, 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 in at large scale. But here we will, this is then, I to compare two different uh, processings. So we, we will see that in a, in a split window we can see the difference between two different uh, implementations. We create a map and then uh, what you see on the right is a deferred processing mode. So you see on the left part is, is one implementation, on the right part is another implementation and we can see how uh, of the two, uh, which one of the two is, is better performing in, in, in some areas. So uh, to give the example, uh, one is, um, 
is actually uh, using some of the classification files that are um, used by that are produced by by sent to court so there are some cloud information some uh, some uh, vegetation information so, uh, classifications and you see and on the right is uh, an actual distance map to uh, to clouds you see there's some uh, some black dark uh, spots over there which were not um, uh, there in the in the distance to cloud because it's a, it's a shadow and so the the, the larger distances are um, um, are not taken into account uh, in the left but in in, in the right. Here you see some um, another. F this is then an, some flaw of uh, the, the the processing on the right, where there were some remaining clouds. Um, that were not detected by the cloud algorithm. So even there, if you take into account the distance to cloud, but if the cloud was not uh, discovered, then uh, the distance doesn't bring anything. Whereas the other algorithm, for example, was uh, taking into account a maximum NDVI and, 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 and uh, favoring all those pixels with the maximum NDVI and was not taking that cloud. So each of those, just, just to show that each of the algorithms had their own uh, flaws and, 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 and pros, and using this uh, uh, interactive approach, it's much easier to design your, um, your algorithm. And with this, I'd like to end. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you, Peter. I think that's really interesting. And I think the interactive, um, like on the fly, processing and visualization is really, really cool. And we don't have that. I'm jealous. <laughs> so we've got questions in the audience. How well supported uh, is NetCDF format? Because all of the presentation I see with open data cubes are just processing Landsat and Sentinels, but no one actually speaks about NetCDF files, which are very complex files for file formats. Um, for now, we are, we're not using NetCDF. I mean, we're using GDAL as a, um, as, as a backbone to, to access all the data. So normally, all formats of GDAL should be supported. Uh, here, um, we try to use all the formats as they come into by the, the data provider. So mm -hmm. in, in, in this case, when it's Sentinel-2, uh, we are using directly the, the JPEG-2000 mm -hmm. as they, and, and we store them as such. As they, those are the, the majority of the, of the data we're, we're using. Um, we're not using NetCDF for, for the moment. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so, if I've well understood, uh, you write an algorithm in Python and it's um, um, transcripted to uh, some JavaScript. Is that right? Um, the library is it's it's a bit like what you have in with the the bindings of uh, of GDAL to Python. So the, the the user is writing everything in Python. So it's the the Python library that is uh, the PyJO library is 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 used by the user. And in uh, under the hood, it's it's accessing the uh, the C plus uh, plus code. Uh, yeah, no, my question was more on on the algorithm. I I'm not completely familiar with uh, OpenEO. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, is the Python way of expressing uh, your algorithm, algorithms something that is standardized by uh, uh, okay. OpenEO, or was it your uh, own API? Is that was okay, my yeah, question. That, um, it's a bit, uh, I, I understand uh, better the question now. Um, Part of it is uh, what I've shown in the end, the example was not really um, a, an application of OpenEO. It was not ready yet uh, for OpenEO. So this has been written in pure uh, Python. Uh, however, if we would uh, uh, solve it the OpenEO way, which is uh, all not, not fully uh, there yet, um, the user would write um, the, uh, his own code in his own language uh, could be R, uh, Python, or JavaScript, and then there is an interpreter in between. So, at each of those languages, have their own interpreter to um, translate this into a middle layer. And the middle layer is this is a type of a graph uh, where you just define all the different steps uh, that are needed uh, in, in in a standardized language. This is uh, then in the in the core API, and then each of the backend is interpreting this standard language into his own language, and that could be uh, whatever language also, but that then up to the, the, the end 
the back end to, to do this work. Uh, but, but the code we have been uh, using here to create those uh, global uh, mosaics, uh, that was not ready yet for, uh, for OpenEO. So that was just in, in plain uh, uh, Python.